Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 26th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, both the ADN and the News Miner editorial pages throw in with the top 20% hook, line, and sinker by calling for PFD cuts without even addressing other revenue options first. Second, going in the opposite direction from the ADN and News Miner editorial pages, a newly revealed poll shows the majority of Alaskans oppose PFD cuts and favor using other revenue measures. Third, our initial thoughts on the new oil tax initiative. And finally, in the bonus round, Michael and I talk about the governor's new communication efforts. And now, let's join Michael. We are ready to rock and roll. Uh, I've been following along some of these stories that you and I have been discussing uh, off the air getting ready for today's show. And uh, I got to say, every time I turn around and look, it is one more, uh, it seems to be one more newspaper, or one more opinion piece, or one more editorial board that says the cutting of Alaska's PFD is the best thing that could possibly happen for Alaska because that means we're living within our means, which I just shake my head at and go, wait, that's not really what it means. It means you're taxing Alaskans and ignoring the potential. Uh, But you're saying that uh, a couple of the big papers are all on board with this uh, protecting the, you know, the top 20 percent at the expense of the lower, you know, 40 percent. Yeah, both. In the weekend editions of both the Anchorage Daily News and the Fairbanks News Miner, uh, they came out with editorials, not not op-ed pieces by others that they published on the editorial page, but editorials by those newspapers' editorial boards uh, that essentially endorsed um, cutting the PFD. The the ADN uh, took it up in the context of of whether or not the legislature should. Uh, uh, have another special session, how they should respond if the governor calls another special session on the PFD. Uh, the, the Fairbanks News Miner took it up somewhat differently in terms of uh, what the future of the PFD should be. Uh, but both uh, uh, recommended, both took the position that the PFD should be cut uh, on a permanent basis going forward. What's, what's really disappointing hugely disappointing is that neither uh, publication talked about, talked either about the distributional impact of that on Alaska families uh, and the fact that cutting the PFD is a hugely regressive tax that, that, that takes more money on a percentage basis from middle and lower income Alaska families than the top 20% and takes none from non-residents. They didn't talk about that and what's, what's even more disappointing is they didn't talk about any of the alternatives uh, to, cutting, uh, to cutting the PFD. Both essentially said uh, that we're finished cutting spending, uh, and now it's time to, to make the cut from the PFD permanent. They didn't talk about the fact that if we're finished cutting spending, what that means is we now ought to be talking about new revenues, and here's the alternative uh, new revenues, and, and here's why – uh, here's the strengths and the weaknesses of each of those alternative new revenues, including including the PFD potentially, but they didn't do that. They just went straight from A, which is we need more money, to B, uh, we need to cut the PFD. And, and I think not only is that disappointing from a policy standpoint, 
I think it's hugely disappointing from a public education standpoint. They're not even discussing uh, for the benefit of Alaskans, for the be- benefit of their readers. They're not even discussing uh, the alternatives. They're not even discussing the distri- distributional impact. That is exactly the same approach that Senator Von Imhoff and others in the legislature uh, who, are rep- who represent the top 20 percent uh, of Alaska it's exactly the same approach that they're taking, which is uh, don't bother us with any alternatives. Don't bother us with any discussion of the distributional impacts. Just go straight to cutting the PFD. Uh, and the subtext of that always is because it doesn't tax us. It doesn't tax the top 20 percent. It pushes responsibility off on middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, and so I, I, I can't help. When I read when I read the ADN's editorial and when I read the Fairbanks News uh, Minor editorial, I can't help but think that they're just throwing in with the top 20 percent. It's basically they've now sided. Uh, both of them, both the editorial boards, have sided with the top 20 percent of Alaska Alaskans against the remaining 80 percent. And I, that's just I, I I I was sort of shocked when I read. Uh, read both those editorials that they didn't discuss uh, the alternatives. They just went straight to cutting the PFD, and I think it's doing a huge disservice to Alaskans. Well, uh, in terms of in terms of what they're doing, and I think this has been a this has not been an ongoing problem this entire time. I mean, all four years of this taking of the PFD, um, even you know there there are a couple what I consider to be pretty good uh, uh, journalists out there, uh, James Brooks and a couple others, but even they have really failed to suss out the distributional impacts of this and say, wow, this is really very regressive. This really only affects, uh, you know, the, the, the or, or, you know, supremely affects those lower 40 percent income earners. And, it, you know, they, they haven't kind of put the pieces together to take a look at all of those that are really pushing for these things are, you know, the vast majority of them are in the top 20 percent or top 10 or top 5 percent. Uh, of income earners, and that's why they have avoided this discussion of any other form of taxation. Uh, but they just—I mean, even if they it, avo- even if they ignored that, the fact that this disproportional impact on the lower income Alaskans, the fact that it pushes, you know, uh, up to eight percent of Alaskans below the poverty line when they tap into the PFD like that—it's um, a little disheartening to see that just that lack of, I, I guess, journalistic follow through. Uh, that they wouldn't get both sides of an equation like that. Yeah, and and there is one article that I that I point to continually point to that really did that. It's a 2017 article that Nat Hertz did while he was still in still with the ADN. Uh, that was a report. It was it was right after the ITEP, the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy uh, report that that was done for the legislature. Uh, it was right after that report came out that really that report uh, did a great job going into the distributional impacts, the effect on various uh, Alaska income segments of the various alternatives. And right after that report, Nat did what I think was an outstanding article summarizing the report and, and walking through the impacts. But that's it. That's a 2017 article in the Anchorage Daily News that I think stands out as as sort of the as sort of a good analysis of the distributional impacts. From there on out, you really haven't seen that. It's just um, uh, Alaska's Alaska's spending a lot. We don't have enough revenue. We need to find additional revenue. Let's just cut the PFT. And and you find that uh, in uh, in the news articles. You find that uh, in the in the in the commentary. Uh, uh, the op-ed pieces that are published by the papers, and now you find it directly from the editorial boards of both the both the state's uh, two two leading newspapers. And that's, I it, they're just not. Uh, the frustrating part of this is they're not doing a service to Alaskans. They're doing a service right. to the top twenty percent, <clears throat> right? By essentially telling every by essentially keeping the ke- keeping the information from everybody else. Uh, but they're not doing a they're not doing a service to uh, to the state of Alaska in terms of developing a solid fiscal policy. Now, you and I have been talking about the impacts of this for the last couple of years, pretty solid. And yet it seems like the majority of Alaskans haven't really connected the dots here and seen this, that it is 
an impact of kind of business as usual amongst the top 20 percent, whether they be Republican or Democrats who have fought kind of against this, uh, who are okay with taking the PFD and impacting those lower income Alaskans. And it just seems like most of Alaska has not connected the dots. And and to me, that is kind of mind boggling. So what what should be our takeaway on this number one here with uh, with the two papers now kind of espousing the same views? What should our takeaway be? And, and you know, what can we do on this? Well, I think I think it's incumbent on legislators, legislators who understand the distributional impact to start talking about it. Part of the way that the top 20 percent has controlled the message is is Natasha and others in the legislature have just sort of continually made this leap. It's it's we're spending a lot. We don't have enough revenue. We need to cut the PFD. And and the newspapers have just sort of followed that same line. I think that that those legislators who understand the issues uh, need to be talking about it and in that fashion uh, uh, sort of pick up, uh, uh, put, put the links together, put the, put the pieces together uh, in hopes that, that the newspapers start reporting what those legislators were saying to counterbalance what uh, Senator Von Imhoff uh, and others are saying. I'm going to, I mean, one thing that I've sort of taken on for myself, I'm going to write an op-ed piece to to hopefully get published these papers that, that that point that out. Letters to the editor from others, um, uh, I think, is an important uh, piece of, of trying to get this message out there. But it's um, <laughs> we're, we're going to have to step up our game, I think. Um, the legislators in particular, the legislators who understand this issue uh, about the distri- distributional impacts, are going to have to step up uh, our game to, uh, to to get to sort of push this issue forward because it's clear now that the that the editorial boards at least are taking the position that that issue doesn't exist it's just straight to cutting the pfd um, uh, and uh, and going on from there it's going to be up to us and others to 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 find different ways to push the issue forward brad keithley is our guest alaskans for sustainable budget we're talking about our weekly top three let's move on to number two which uh, you just mentioned nat hers he now writes for the alaska public media at Alaska's Energy Desk, um, he uh, put out an interesting article here uh, a few days ago, talking about a poll that was commissioned by the Walker or by the uh, Dunleavy administration, which was not released. It was only noticed through expenditures because it shows something that I think some Republicans would have been kind of surprised about. It was a poll that showed that more Alaskans narrowly favoring taxation. On, the, on themselves in the state of Alaska, which kind of flies in the face of what we've talked about here on the program. Uh, give us some rundown and your thoughts on it. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a great piece of journalism by Nat. I don't always agree with Nat. I now will have mentioned him uh, uh, positively twice uh, so far, but, but I, don't, I don't always agree with him. But it's a great, great piece of journalism by Nat. He, he identified uh, an expenditure in the governor's spending records uh, uh, that are available online. Uh, followed up, did a public information request, and got uh, the results of a study or uh, of a poll that the administration commissioned uh, in late June or in June, at the end of May and June, uh, by Dittman Research. Now, when I've when I've talked about this uh, on Facebook and elsewhere, uh, a lot of people who have said, a lot of people have pushed back and said, "Oh, that's just you know, I don't believe that poll. That's not. I didn't get asked, so so it's not valid. It's not a valid poll." I've we need to say quickly, this is a poll by Dittman Research. It's a poll by Matt Larkin, uh, who many of those same people who are now saying they don't believe it uh, uh, have previously said in other contexts that they think, you know, Dittman Research is sort of the gold standard of Alaska polling. Uh, it's the pollster that the governor's used all along. It's the pollster that the governor used uh, during the campaign uh, to, to help uh, direct campaign strategy and, and who people uh, praised during the records or during during that period. So, I, I don't think you can easily. I don't think you can quickly dismiss dismiss this poll and say it's a bogus poll and 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 doesn't doesn't reflect true facts. It is by uh, what what both people inside and outside the state say is the is the state's best poller, and it's got it's got two interesting conclusions in it. Um, one that uh, I, both of which are a surprise. Now, it's important to say that this poll was conducted at the beginning uh, of the summer. Uh, it only is coming to light now because it wasn't released by the governor's office at the time. 
uh, but it was conducted at the beginning of the summer before we had um, uh, whatever additional, well, before we had the end of the regular session and then the additional special session. Right. This is before, uh, before the big, had all, 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 this is before the big veto hammer came down the first time. Right. So it's, so it's somewhat, I mean, it, it's, it doesn't incorporate the, the effects of all that. Uh, but it is uh, it is a good representation or a, a, a poll about what the opinion was uh, uh, going into that, and it has two big conclusions. One is the two big takeaways uh, that I think are significant. One is uh, that people oppose uh, the poll showed that people oppose uh, cutting the PFD. Now, it's uh, it's not I mean it's not by a huge margin, but it is by a significant margin. Fifty four percent. Opposed, either somewhat opposed or strongly opposed, cutting the PFD. Forty-three uh, percent were in favor of uh, 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 cutting the PFD. So, uh, support twenty-one percent strongly support, twenty-two percent somewhat support. So, by a, a fifty-four to forty-three margin, uh, people uh, uh, people opposing cutting the PFD. The other the other one that that I think is uh, uh, surprising to people is the outcome on. Uh, taxation uh, by a narrower margin. Uh, 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 the the poll uh, concluded that people uh, 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 support taxation. The question was, do you believe more taxes are needed to fund state government? Direct question. Yes, for 52. No, 46. A six percent margin with a with a two percent undecided, two uh, percent undersure. And a four percent margin of error, so it's a fairly it's a you, you can say that's a fairly close poll, uh, but but in the same poll as people say they oppose cutting the PFD, uh, people are saying the the poll results were that yes people support uh, taxes that more taxes are needed to fund state government. Which, uh, it didn't say who the taxes are on. It right. didn't say it was on individuals or. Corporations are all companies, but it did say that people supported uh, increased taxation. We were just talking uh, about number two, which is this unreleased poll from Dittman Research that had been commissioned by the governor's office, which showed a couple interesting things. One, it showed that Alaskans were opposed to uh, using the PFD for government spending, but at the same time, respondents of the poll believed that we did need more taxes in this state to pay for state government. And again, that seems to be a very contradictory belief. And I wanted to get Brad's take on what do you think it means for Alaskans moving forward? What does it say about us? And what does it say about potentials for things like we've talked about in the past, a flat tax, et cetera? Well, I think I think the poll is frankly consistent with with the discussion you and I've had over the last several years, um, and frankly, just uh, consistent with with the 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 reaction I just had to the to the Anchorage Daily News and the and the Fairbanks, Fairbanks News Miner, and, and that is this: it is look, we're not getting spending cut down to revenues. Revenues have dropped a lot. Uh, spending, uh, there's been a lot of pushback on spending, and and spend, and there's a lot of people who want to continue spending. The legislature wants to continue spending, as you and I were just ca- talking about in the break. The, the Republican minority. Uh, to varying degrees, want to want to maintain spending. They don't want to make all the cuts uh, that uh, that that the governor originally proposed. So, I, so how are we going to finance those? And and this is where I think the poll comes in and 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 has has frankly something very important to say. How are we going to finance those? The poll says the Alaskans don't want to cut the PFD, and I think what you're seeing is exactly what we've been talking about, middle and lower income Alaska families pushing back and saying, we don't want to cut the PFD, that that's, that's an important source of income to us. Um, and we don't want to see, we don't want to see a cut, but we do recognize that, that in some ways that there's going to be additional spending, either we want spending to continue, uh, or we recognize, uh, spending is going to continue. Uh, at levels that are above current revenue, how are we going to finance that? And I think the answer that's coming through in the poll is we need taxes. We need to we need to increase revenues through taxes. We have to get Alaskans with uh, with skin in the game uh, to 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 pay for this additional spending, uh, and we're ready to to pay more in taxes. So, it, to me, it's it's a consistent, it, it's an understandable message that's coming from the poll in terms of middle and the lower income Alaska families saying, look, 
we PFD cuts are unfair. They're regressive. They 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 harm us uh, more. They make us pay more than the top 20 percent. Don't use PFD cuts. But we understand that the state needs additional revenue, uh, and so let's consider taxes. Very close poll on taxes. Very close results on taxes. Don't want to overstate it. 52 to 46 with 2% undecided, a 4% margin of error, very close on that, on that issue. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, a, a majority uh, in favor of, uh, of saying taxes. Now, it's important also, the next question was uh, really about cuts. It's, the question was in the poll, Governor Dunleavy proposed a state budget that includes significant cuts. Do you support or oppose the governor's budget? Um, and it, that poll result was 47 to 47. So, I mean, there's that, that showed that there's support out there for cuts, but there's equal pu- equal pushback. Uh, uh, 47 to 47, there's equal pushback uh, on, uh, on on pushing forward cuts. Again, at the beginning of the summer, before we had the end of the regular session and the special sessions, but but equal pushback on that question. So, here's what you've got. You've got you've got. We're not we're not. There's not a majority in favor of cuts. Um, it's 47 and 47 on cuts. Uh, we're not in favor of funding additional spending through cutting the PFD, uh, 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 a majority in favor of preserving the PFD. So how are we going to fund it if we don't make cuts in spending? Taxes, a majority in favor of taxes. And I I think that's how that's sort of how you thread the needle. That's the message that to me is coming through in that poll. And, of course, uh, you have uh, stated that you do not think that there is the political will uh, to really cut anything more substantially in the state of Alaska right now, that uh, really the future is going to be taxation. And you've talked about, of course, flat tax and other options. But leading on to our third option, there is another group, uh, which uh, as our third uh, title of the of the third item for the top three, that is saying, no, no, what we could do is we could go back and restructure the oil taxation and uh, and get more money out of the oil companies on these large legacy fields, not the new fields, not the smaller ones, but on the large legacy fields that are established, and uh, and we could put taxation on that, which could you know tune up about a you know a billion dollars uh, into the state treasury. Let's go on to number three. Sure. So uh, the, the the often rumored uh, initiative. Uh, to, put, to go on the ballot with an initiative to increase oil taxes uh, became public last week, um, and and the proposal was uh, laid out there to uh, on how they on how they wanted to increase oil taxes. To be very honest, I was surprised uh, at 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 the proposal. Not the not not that there's going to be an initiative on oil taxes. I think uh, there's been a lot of rumors about that and expectation uh, that was coming, but the proposal they did. When Senator Wilikowski, who's one of the one of the signatories, one of the one of the proponents of the of the initiative, has talked about this during the legislature, it's it's been in the context of let's eliminate what he calls the oil tax credits, uh, which are really adjusters to the to the rate mechanism. Let's wipe out the the rate adjustment mechanism and let's just go to a 35 percent tax across the board, which is what the what the what, what the starting point is before you start putting in the the, the, the adjusters, um, and and he's talked about that raising 1.2 billion that the that the adjusters the all tax credits uh, are worth 1.2 billion. You wipe them out, you raise 1.2 billion. That would raise oil taxes uh, across the board, uh, and all oil would be would be taxed in the same fashion. And and I think I think the general expectation. Was that when this initiative came out, it was going to be that to to, to remove the credits? Uh, that's not what the initiative is. The initiative is is a very targeted tax uh, on on the legacy oil fields, primarily Prudhoe uh, and Kaparik, the two big fields uh, on the North Slope, and it focuses raising a billion dollars from those fields alone. As opposed to raising a billion two from all sources of production on the slope, uh, it targets those two fields uh, uh, with with a huge tax increase. Overall, this is a 40% tax increase to raise another billion dollars from the industry 
is a 40% tax increase uh, on the industry. And it targets all of that on, on the legacy fields and particularly uh, on, these, uh, on these two fields and really uh, targets it on BP and Conoco when you boil right down to it, boil, boil it right down to the essence of what, they're, of what the initiative is doing. That is, I mean, they justify that by saying these are legacy fields. Uh, they don't, I mean, they're, they're in harvest mode, as, as, uh, as, as Senator Wilikowski has used that term from time to time. Um, and so we're just going to go into those fields since, since they're already discovered, <clears throat> since they don't, they don't need new exploration, uh, we're going to go in and just target those fields and, and take a higher percentage of revenue for the state uh, from, the, from those fields. The problem with that is, is you have to dump a huge tax increase on those two fields to get all of that billion dollars uh, out of those two fields, and in 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 a way that that I don't I don't think Alaskans uh, uh, broadly understand, those two fields take additional investment uh, uh, on an ongoing base, basis to to maintain production in those fields. Prudhoe, for example, has had a substantial investment since discovery, since it was initially initially developed, has had substantial investment in in finding new ways to improve the recovery factor, uh, the amount of oil uh, to be uh, to be recovered out of the field. It, it, when Prudhoe was initially discovered, uh, the expectation was they would get about 40% of the oil in place uh, out of the field. You never get 100% of the oil out of a field. You always have to. You always end up leaving some oil behind. And Prudhoe, the, the initial expectation was 40% through investment, through a lot of a lot of uh, uh, engineering creativity uh, uh, that was that was incentivized by the returns that the that the owners were going to get. They we even factor of Prudhoe uh, from 40% to 60% uh, over time. That's 20% more uh, oil, uh, uh, or half again as much oil. <laughs> being recovered out of Prudhoe than than originally expected, and that's come with a lot of investment. So, 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 and and Caparis the same way. Yeah, and Brad, this means that of course this could have ramifications for future investment and everything else. Targeting these fields is gonna is gonna feel good. They're gonna be able to, you know, they're gonna they're gonna message by saying, oh, these are old mature fields. Uh, there's there's really not a whole lot going on in those fields. We're just gonna scrape more money for the state out of those fields as opposed to let it be a windfall profit to the companies. But they're, but they're not, that's overlooking the fact that those fields continue to need investment uh, in order to, in order to keep, uh, in order to keep production up from those fields. Prudhoe had no decline. Uh, the Prudhoe field had no decline the last year. That's, that's a combination of increased recovery from the initial, from the initial produ producing areas as well as investment in and development of additional satellite fields, what are called satellite fields within the Prudhoe unit. That field is benefiting, Alaskans are benefiting from ongoing investment in those fields. And dumping a huge tax burden just on those two fields uh, is, gonna, is gonna take away a significant amount of the incentive, if not eliminate the incentive, to make those continued investments and we'll see uh, significantly increased uh, decline rates from those fields. What do you say to people? One of the arguments uh, that I've heard and and uh, and I in in part agree with is, you know, maybe maybe the billion dollars is not the right target number. But I mean, you've got these legacy fields that have all all these investments, and in some ways they're they're pulling almost no taxes out of those fields uh, through offsets and some other things. Uh, and shouldn't these be, you know, w with offering this, the tax credits they've had in the past and some of the incentives that they've done and some of the other breaks they get on some of the newer fields and the smaller producers, shouldn't we be getting a, a, a bigger portion of taxation on fields that are old and settled and, and uh, you know, maybe not the billion, maybe that's too much, but shouldn't we at least look at that and see if there's more revenue that we're missing on the way out the door? Well, as you and I have discussed before, I think it's time to have another look at, at oil taxes. It's been five years, six years since uh, since we set up SB 21. Uh, the world has changed a little bit. The, the U.S. corporate income tax rate has changed, which I think uh, creates some question about whether those tax rates are right. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's time to take a look uh, at that. But I but I don't think you can say 
that there's just a bunch of free profit running out of the run, running out of those legacy fields, and we need to we need to target target those and dump a billion dollars of additional revenue demand uh, uh, on on those fields. We do need to take a look at it. I think what this initiative will do is trigger the legislature in the upcoming session to take a deep dive into oil taxes and and have a discussion about whether there are ways to uh, to, to change SB 21 but still provide an adequate incentive to, to bring continue to bring additional investment to the state yeah that I think I think that's the I think that's the right approach this initiative I think just just went down the wrong road Gary says in the chat room a sales tax will be more palatable than an income tax this will spread the burden to everyone who steps foot in the state you both just want this burden on the shoulders of hard-working Alaskans uh, to which I will say, we're, the hardworking Alaskans are already feeling the burden through their through their PFD cuts. Um, a sales tax is regressive, and although it would capture a lot of the dollars from the tourists, it doesn't do anything for the flyover people who are flying up to Prudhoe and then flying back home, wherever home may be, whereas an AGI flat tax could potentially capture some more of that money. I think we talked about somewhere in the neighborhoods of five or $600 million. Your thoughts on that before we let you go? Well, Two things. One, it, the sales tax is regressive, and it and it, it it doubles up on the regressive re, regressivity of the local sales taxes that we already have in place. It's not like tourists aren't being taxed; they're being taxed largely through local taxes in the major tourist areas, uh, through through sales taxes in the major tourist areas. You dump a statewide sales tax on top of that, uh, and it sort of doubles up on the re regressivity. Uh, of the tax uh, on 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 the local economy and in, in in those in those locations, the second is uh, a flat tax that you and I have talked about reaches all Alaskans. It reaches every uh, in, income bracket. They all contribute the same percent. People think when they when they hear about an income tax, they think it works like the federal income tax, and it would only be on forty the top forty percent, the wage earners. But the federal income tax or the the flat tax that you and I have talked about. Uh, would reach all Alaskans. It would apply to the PFD income uh, as well as uh, as any income uh, throughout uh, throughout the um, uh, 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 throughout out all the income brackets. I mean, when you when you talk about uh, when you talk about uh, income sources, I mean the the top 20 percent has a large share of their income coming from investment income, uh, and it would reach investment income as well. So, two 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 issues or two responses to Gary. One, a sales tax is just another regressive tax. It doubles up on the local tax that we already have. And two, a flat tax that you and I have talked about does reach all Alaskans. It's not focused just on the, the 40 percent wage earners. It is across the board uh, uh, applicable to all income. And as a result of that is a much lower tax uh, in terms of the tax rate that would be applied for example, to cover the, the deficit, deficit this year would be about a 4% tax as opposed to a much higher rate if it was just focused on wage earners. Brad, um, you've been following kind of some of the things that have been going on uh, with the governor. I know you've been traveling, but you've been watching things from a distance. And uh, one of the things that I found fascinating here recently was the governor's uh, decision to kind of go straight to the people with the message. And I know one of the challenges, and you and I have talked about this, and I've talked about this with other people, is that the governor has not been very good at messaging and getting information out and doing some of these different things. What uh, What are your thoughts on the governor's change of tactics as far as getting uh, you know his message out uh, to the people, talking about things? I mean, that taking the, the ADN to task for that misleading headline and some of the other things. What are your thoughts on his change uh, in his messaging strategy? Oh, I think I think it's positive, Michael. Um, the 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 problem through the legisl the, the problem throughout the legislative period is that the governor spoke very rarely. Um, it was he was sort of I mean he took the position that he was waiting for the legislature to come up with their action uh, on the uh, on the budget, uh, come up with their proposal on the budget, then he would respond to that. And and really, uh, there was an occasion there were occasional uh, comments, but. But really, he left the, the field, the messaging field, to the legislature, and and the, and left it to Senator Giesel and uh, Senator von Imhoff and and others who who spoke often uh, about these issues as the legislature was was going through the process, and and I think that left the left. I, I think that really distorted the message 
that was coming through uh, to Alaskans. It, it left the field and left the messaging entirely to the legislator, legislature and those legislators in particular that were trying to drive uh, higher spending levels than the governor wanted and trying to drive uh, 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 cutting the PFD. I, the governor's pushed back on that now by saying he's going to end run the media and, and, and go direct to the people, I think, is, a, is, is, is good in two ways. One, uh, the governor's talking more. Uh, than he than he than he seemed to during the legislative session, or at least got got reported during the legislative session. And two, he's he's coming through uh, in an unfiltered way, where he's where he's getting his message direct to Alaska. And he's not relying on the media to uh, the, uh, the 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 media the media to correctly cut the sound bites and uh, and, and get the message across. But now the issue is. What message is the governor is the governor going to get across? I mean, he's he's created this new channel, but but now so it's now up to him about what message he's going to deliver, um, and 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 he's got he's he's got some things he needs to confront, the 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 vetoes the cuts uh, were not were not very deep. By the time you get to the second round of vetoes, uh, we don't have a deep set of cuts. We have about a six percent cut. In the agency operating budget, for example, we have a 25% deficit. We have a 25% revenue deficiency relative to spending levels, but the but the cuts on the agency operating budget are about uh, are about six percent. The capital budget. I mean, they played some of the old games that we've talked about over the years, which is push a bunch of spending to the DA, uh, designated general funds, and, so that you can so it looks like there's there's less spending in the unrestricted general funds. They did that on the capital budget. There's only a, a billion or a million dollars uh, in UGF funding in the capital budget. The rest of it's over in DGF um, and others. So it looks like there's deeper cuts that are that are being made to, to UGF spending, unrestricted general fund spending, uh, than than there are. Um, so he he's created a new channel. I think that's great. I think it gives him an opportunity to get a, to get his message more clearly out there. By creating the new channel, he sort of implied that he's going to use it, and so he's going to be on the record more often talking about these issues. But now he has to figure out what the message is and how he's going to explain uh, where we're going from from here. And I'm not sure he's done that yet. I'm not sure I I understand exactly where we're going uh, where we're going from here, uh, particularly with the with the with the move to to undo some of the vetoes that he had made, undo some of the budget cuts that he had made earlier in the in the year and i would agree i mean i still haven't you know i still haven't uh, uh gotten a good answer as to why for example on the university cut you know they said they could live with a 65 million dollar cut just not the 130 why didn't you know in this three-year plan why wasn't the first year 30 a uh, 60 million dollar cut 65 million dollar cut why put it off? Why wait? It took all the pressure off the university, and I mean it's a real problem. Got about thirty seconds here, Brad. Well, basically, he he he. I mean, it, it's it's the Republican minority in the House. I mean, basically, they walked away, walked back on on their support of some of these vetoes. He didn't have sixteen in the legislature that was going to uphold the vetoes. So it's not it's not entirely the governor that's 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 walking backwards here. It's the Republicans in the House that are walking backwards and. And and so the governor needs to talk about where we're yeah. going Got uh, in light of the fact you can't count. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets, linked to his Facebook page or up at the top of this page here. You can see it in the description. You can click on that and follow his posts throughout the day. If you want to argue with him on Facebook, he loves to do that. And uh, you could talk with him <laughs> there. Uh, Brad, thank you so much, my friend, for coming on board and joining us. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming on board. Uh, thank you so much. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.